Okay, chemists, in this lesson we're going to look at an elimination reaction called the E2 mechanism. Uh, this is what happens when you have something very electron rich and basic, like sodium hydroxide. We're still talking about the reactions of alkyl halides, but instead of doing a substitution reaction, we're going to do an elimination reaction. This is what you get with things like tertiary halides, much more sterically crowded halides, uh, such as this t-butyl bromide molecule. Your t-butyl bromide, in this case, your tertiary halide is still acting as an electrophile. But the other reactant is no longer a nucleophile. It's now going to act as a base. What's the difference? Well, a nucleophile does a substitution reaction. It becomes part of the molecule. A base just takes away a hydrogen, like we saw in general chemistry. The hydrogen it takes away is the one that's beta to the leaving group, which is the halogen. Beta means one away from the carbon attached to the leaving group. So I'll label them here. That's alpha, where the bromine is attached. And right next to it is the beta position. So draw an arrow from the hydroxide oxygen to that H. Draw another arrow from one of the CH bonds, that one, to become a CC pi bond. And then the carbon bromine bond breaks, and you get your halogen. We actually saw this two lessons ago when we first learned about elimination reactions. What we didn't specify is this is what you really get with tertiary halides. That's the theme for today. Tertiary halides and strong bases give you elimination products. What does the elimination product look like for this? We'll follow the curved arrows. We still have all four of the carbons in our tert-butyl group. The bromine is no longer there, but we have a new pi bond between those two carbons uh, and one less hydrogen. What did we make as a result? We made water. And then we also have our counter ion, sodium, which is ionically bonded to the leaving group, the bromide. So we have the E2 product. Water we'll call our byproduct. And then bromide is our leaving group. Uh, just like the SN2 reaction, this is concerted, so it happens all in one step. So if I drew a reaction energy diagram for this from some arbitrary starting point to some end point, you would have one transition state and no intermediate. Remember, that's what a concerted reaction is. And if you're curious, you know, what do these diagrams even mean? Think back to your general chemistry class. From where you start to where you uh, crest, that's your activation energy, E sub A. The difference between where you start and where you finish is your change in enthalpy of the reaction. Usually, it depends on what you're plotting, but this is probably what you see for an enthalpy graph. And then this is uh, also a bimolecular reaction. The rate is a rate constant times the concentration of both reactants, t butyl bromide and the base, in this case, hydroxide ion. No, we don't do a lot of kinetic studies in this class, but that's just what the 2 in E2 actually means. Okay, so this is what we see when we have a tertiary halide, and something that's reactive and electron-rich acts as a base instead of a nucleophile. Speaking of bases, here's a nice chart with bases from weak to strong, and I just really want to focus on what's on the right-hand side. We are primarily going to be looking for things that are usually oxygen or nitrogen anions. That's not always the case, but that's what makes a good base. Small, electron-rich, negatively charged, that combination with a tertiary halide almost certainly is going to give you an E2 elimination. Okay, so there's some stereochemical consequences of the E2, kind of like how we had the inversion of stereochemistry with the SN2. There's other stereochemical features of the E2. Number one, the hydrogen that you take away, which is beta to the leaving group, has to be oriented in an anti-periplanar geometry with respect to the leaving group. What does that mean? Well, it's shown right here in this example, uh, which actually is t-butyl bromide. I just drew out the three beta hydrogens. So the hydrogen that you lose, this one, and the leaving group that goes away have to be oriented in opposite directions, pointing uh, as if you were looking at a Newman projection from a few units ago. Let's draw a Newman projection of this. Looking down the carbon-carbon bond. If we draw our bromine right there, and then we have methyls on the same carbon as the bromine, and we have three hydrogens on the other carbon, in this case in the front of the Newman projection, the hydrogen that goes is the one that's anti to the bromine. That's what that means. So in this case, our base, I'm using methoxide here. Methoxide will take away that H. That CH bond will break. It's hard to show that in the Newman projection. 
and then you have the carbon bromine bond break. So just make a note, H and leaving group need to be anti. You can look at this example and go, why do I care? This doesn't really have a restriction in this example. Well, watch out for examples in rings. So common in rings. For example, let's say I had a halide uh, on a cyclohexane ring. In this case, I'll put a methyl up here on an asymmetric carbon, I'll put a bromine down here, and then I'll say, what do I get if I treat this with a strong base, uh, like hydroxide, and I tell you I'm going to get an E2 product. Well, let's draw in the beta hydrogens. So alpha is the carbon where the bromine is attached, and beta is right next to it, and there's two of them, and they both have hydrogens on them. The one at the bottom of the ring has two hydrogens, and I'm going to show them one coming out of the page and one going into the page. The one in the upper right of that ring only has one beta hydrogen, and it's going into the page. So when I have to pick which one I lose, there's only one hydrogen that's capable of being lost in this E2 reaction. It's that one because it's pointing in the opposite direction of the bromide. So I would get a cyclohexene with an alkene in the lower right of the ring, and then that asymmetric methyl is along for the ride. And you could draw this if you wanted to in a chair to really show how they are anti. Remember from the previous unit, we learned about chair cyclohexanes. There's a chair confirmation. And if I draw the confirmation that's necessary for this, in order for the H and the leaving group, in this case the bromine, to be anti, you actually have to go via the less stable chair conformer. Uh, in other words, because that's the only way that gives you the, the anti-relationship. So uh, less stable conformer needed in this case. So the leaving group needs to be axial. That just means I could look out for other six-membered ring questions uh, where maybe I have a tert butyl somewhere in the ring, and that's forcing one of the chair conformations to really be the primary conformer. And if that ends up giving me a leaving group that's not axial, uh, that's going to be a very tough candidate to do an E2 reaction. So those are the kinds of things to look out for with this, this anti-restriction. The other consequence of the E2 reaction is about different possible products when you have multiple H's and the anti-restriction isn't there. Uh, so we can control for this by using different sized bases. So here's a different example. This is acyclic. And what I notice is that if I draw in the possible beta hydrogens, here we have uh, two on that carbon. And then I have three on this methyl. We also have three others on that methyl up there, don't we? But they're identical by symmetry. So I have two different possible beta H's that I could lose from, and that explains the two different products that I get, two different constitutional isomers. But I, I seem to have a preference for one of them. And then it switches when I simply change the base. That's all that's changed. So what's going on here? Let's redraw this starting material. Is that if you use a small base, in this case ethoxide, you'll get a preference for taking away an H that's from a spot where there are fewer hydrogens. So this ethoxide takes this H, CH bond breaks to form a pi bond, carbon bromine bond breaks, and you get this alkene, in this case the major product. We call this the Zaitsev product. And this is normally what we see in E2 reactions. Uh, the Zaitsev is when you have a small base, so ethoxide, methoxide, hydroxide, nothing that's too sterically crowded. And you'll take away an H from a position so that you have uh, fewer H's to pick from. Uh, the reason for that is you get a more stable alkene turns out that the substitution of the alkene uh, dictates its stability. And there's a summary of this in the lower right. 
And what you're noticing here is it gets more stable as you go up this column. So a substituted alkene where there's four carbons in total attached to the alkene functionality is called a tetra substituted alkene, as opposed to an alkene that has only two of the four spots occupied by carbons, the other two obviously by hydrogen. It's called a di-substituted alkene. We'll come back to why this is. For now, I just want to say you're more stable if you are more substituted. And this is a thermodynamic reaction where you will get uh, the major product that is the more substituted. So here we have a tri-substituted alkene as opposed to a di-substituted alkene. So that's the major product that we see with this. However, the beauty of this is we can turn it around. We can force the reaction to give us the less substituted, what's called the non zaitsev alkene. And all we did was use a large base. In this case, that's tert-butoxide. So if I redraw this starting material, the same tertiary halide, so a great candidate for an E2. Why is this such a large base? Well, remember what TBU means. It's a tert butyl group attached to that oxygen. Big base. So it's not going to be able to take away one of these less abundant hydrogens. It's going to take away one of the more abundant hydrogens, in this case, off of one of those two methyl groups. So I'll draw in one of them. Draw a curved arrow from the oxygen to the H. The CH bond breaks to become your pi bond, and the carbon bromine bond uh, breaks to make a bromine leaving group, and you get your less substituted alkene. So here the major is the non zaitsev So we can control which type of product we get just by the size of the base. Um, and as long as the H and the leaving group are anti to each other, the E2 is possible. And this is primarily what you get with tertiary halides and strong bases, typically like one of those three.